Welcome to this weekend, Missouri Politics. Short weekend, Jeff City with the blizzard, but a lot went down. We're here to talk about it with a guy at the center of everything. I say that every time I introduce you, the center of everything, Senator Bill Eigel. Scott, thanks for having me. So, uh, Don Karoff, I'll, I'll be the one that goes out and says the name so that I, so if we have to mess it up, I'll own it. Uh, the, the governor's nominee for, to lead the Department of Health was shot down. Uh, you were part of a, a group of senators that led the effort to uh, not confirm him. Give me the best reason why. So I'll, I'll give you two reasons. One, and this was early on in the confirmation process, I think Don Karoff lost a lot of confidence among senators when he came out in opposition to one of our signature laws that we passed last session uh, that put some restrictions on kind of the COVID crazy environment. That was House Bill 271. Uh, Mr. Karoff said that it haunted him. And that was an indication to me that uh, re regardless of what he was telling us in the committee hearings and even in private meetings, he had a different perspective about where he wanted to take the state and where he wanted to take the health department. No, that uh, was, was a bill different. that was compromised down That's quite right. a bit. I mean, honestly, that bill looks like it's worked. There, there was folks that thought, now, no question. I thought it was interesting. A lot of the local governments backed off COVID restrictions about the end of April, early May, when you'd have been doing this. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, in St. Louis City, the mayor put a health order in. Mm -hmm. The city council hasn't challenged it. It's probably popular. In the county, there's been a lot of acrimony, but there's a lot of acrimony amongst the citizens. Mm -hmm. I thought it actually worked. So I, I, I get again when you have a the health director that's saying that this is not necessarily a bill he supports. Uh, it causes a lot of concern among senators of whether or not he's going to be on the same page of where the legislature wants to see the state go. So that was the first thing. The second thing uh, is you know as often as he kept saying that he was pro-life, which I appreciated, he really struggled to say whether or not he supported public funding of abortions. So uh, you know integrity and honesty, you know that's it. That's a key issue in the Senate, I think. And right those now. were in private conversations, I guess. Uh, well, not only in private conversations but he did fail to answer that in the committee hearing when I was listening to it so uh, both of those things I think uh, kind of caused a lot of concern amongst more than just a couple senators in fact uh, he didn't receive a vote in committee and not a single senator stood up to, to defend him on the floor of the Senate so uh, I think it was a decision by the Senate in our proper role of advice and consent mm -hmm. and we said no and I understand that, uh, that Mike Parsons not happy about that but uh, you know throwing a titter uh, Twitter Tamper tantrum is it's not going to make things any easier moving forward. As you this though, I mean, when you when you go back, did uh, do you know of anybody that opposed him voiced the concerns about him prior to these hearings, maybe back in the fall when he came in? Did, did, was the governor surprised by the opposition? Uh, I, don't, I, I can't speak for if the governor was surprised because he never called me. Uh, I can tell you that, which was uh, I think may come to as a surprise to a lot of yeah. folks. So I was surprised to see kind of the reaction from the governor uh, when he wasn't actually calling senators to make the case directly. So. But like I said, we've got to move forward from here. Uh, I'm looking forward to who the next nominee is going to be, and we'll do the same thing about that nominee. person. Randall Williams left, and let's be honest, there wasn't a parade when he left. There was some issues. Or I don't know that it was his necessarily his idea to leave when he left. Now you have a nominee that comes in. Thought I think most folks thought was moderate guy, maybe within the norm. He doesn't get confirmed. Do you worry that the that job's devalued? You may the next guy you get, next woman you get, may not be a, a top level recruit. Well, I think there are going to be a lot of folks actually interested in that position. In fact, I already know a couple of folks that are interested in that position. Uh, if the governor uh, is interested in some of those inputs, I think myself and other members of the Senate would be happy to discuss that with uh, Mike Parson. But uh, that position is going to continue to be important regardless of the public perception because it's going to be the focal point for the implementation of some of the policies that the legislature wants to see when it comes to uh, whether it's the COVID environment it or any other. It is the hot seat right now, right? Right. It is the hot I mean, seat. Yeah. It's going to be important. Sometimes so. it's MoDOT, sometimes Eagle Devo. This, uh, this is the hot seat. Uh, when you do this again, which you're going to have to do this again, uh, if you have reservations, do you think you'll make the call to the governor next time? We're going to make sure we're taking to make every sure opportunity. That's conversations had. We'll make sure every opportunity is had to reach out to the governor to have those conversations. Let's talk about a uh, another thing that you've uh, been, I would say uncharacteristic, but characteristically outspoken on, and that's the congressional maps. Right now, there's a six-two map. Um, Congressman Cleaver's uh, district could be redrawn to a seven-one map. What's the best case if we was just sitting having a bush like the cottage in in Bus Butler County? What would you make the case to change it for? First of all, I think it's got to be a 7-1 map. Uh, I've been very clear about that because I don't think that we should miss any opportunity. We shouldn't squander an opportunity to send more people to Washington, D.C. that can oppose the Joe Biden agenda. Uh, and I think that if we had, if we polled uh, all three million Republicans here in the state of Missouri, I, I think overwhelmingly they would agree with that assessment. In fact, I think the only ones that maybe don't agree with that assessment also by astronomical coincidence have been elected to the Missouri legislature. So uh, I'm very concerned that if we don't take a positive vote on a 
71 map. Uh, that's going to further separate uh, the, re the Republican legislators in Jefferson City from the people that are voting for them, supporting them, and sending them to Jefferson City in the first place. Myself and my colleagues have gotten hundreds, thousands of phone calls, emails, messages, uh, petition signers of folks that say we've got to do everything we can to oppose the out of control Democratic administration in Washington, D.C. And we're not going to do that by sending more Democrats there. It's not good for rural uh, Missouri to send more Democrats to Washington, D.C. It's not good for anywhere in this state to do that. So uh, I'm focused on the 7 1 map. So tell me where I'm wrong. <clears throat> you get so many Republicans in the state, a lot of them. You could divvy them up six ways, seven ways. While there is a lot of Republicans in this state, you start to cut the edges smaller when you get them into seven. Um, the argument I've heard is, well, we'd rather have a, we'd rather be sure we had six than try to go for seven. Give me the idea. I think in 2022 you could elect seven Republicans to Washington. Could you do that in a year like 06 and 08 where it wasn't such a good Republican year? Well, I think we could because I think a 7-1 map could be drawn where every one of those seven seats were won by Donald Trump in 2020 by more than 15 points. Now, there's, there comes a certain point where even in a Democratic year, each of those seats would have still have been won by uh, the Republican nominee in 18. We could draw them so that and Josh You sacrifice Holland a little bit of compactness, right? You cut uh, a few counties here and there. Actually, and believe it or not, the 7-1 map, uh, according to the computer models, actually have better compactness than the 6-2 than the six two models, uh, which I found surprising, but that's what the numbers say. So uh, it, it's a map that can be compact, it's constitutional, and it can be uh, relatively safe. Now, that doesn't mean that no Republican could possibly ever lose that, but sure. if you look at the, the map that came over from the House right now, uh, that is almost certainly a 5-3 map by the end of the, or by the middle of the decade because of the trends that we're seeing in St. Louis County. So I feel strongly that that uh, we, we would have the support of the public to draw a 7-1 map. And if we fall back uh, to a position of 6-2, of uh, we better make sure that those districts are very strong and we better be prepared to answer the questions from the Republican public on why we did why we squandered this opportunity. You can uh, redistrict the bare knuckle process. Mm -hmm. There's uh, folks that would say you'd like to have your county together, which to me is like, well, duh. Of course you would. Mm -hmm. So would the Speaker in Jeffco. So would the flow leader in St. Louis County. So would the pro tem of the Senate in Franklin County. What's the best case that St. Charles County should be together? I, I think that St. Charles Countyans wanting to be together in the same congressional district is just the same the same ask that any other senator and any other constituent would have anywhere else in the state. People that's, act like you're going to deny that. That's, of course that's true, right? I mean, no one believes that's denied. true. Yeah, so yeah. that's a very natural, normal yeah. thing. It doesn't mean we're politicizing it. It doesn't mean we're trying to do it for, for, for personal gain. It just means that people of like-minded communities want to stick together. 32 other senators natural. feel the same way, right? I mean. Absolutely. In fact, I don't know of a single map where we've split somebody else's county where that person has been okay with sure. it. Sure. So I think that's very natural. I think that it's more pressing even for St. Charles County because of the growth that they they've experienced over the past 30 or 40 years. And so now, naturally, just like we're seeing the maps come out where they're recombining Jefferson County, the people in St. Charles County, which is one of the largest Republican strongholds in the state of Missouri, they want to be kept together in that community of interest. Let me, uh, me in with this. Tomorrow at noon, you'll go to the Senate. I assume, I guess, noon Senate time could be like 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But you're going to go to the Senate tomorrow and uh, theoretically take up the maps bill. How far are you willing to go? There are some things that we need to fight for, and uh, the things that I would fight for is, one, we've got to make sure that the Republican seats uh, that are being drawn are drawn to the best possible way. They're drawn the strongest that they can, and I think we need to fight for a 7-1 map. So I expect a discussion about a 7-1 map on the floor, and I expect that uh, uh, there are conversations, I'll, I'll tell you right now, there are conversations that have been actually been going on for weeks uh, that involved a series of different possible compromises. Uh, we're still exploring those, but right now what's on the table that was passed out of the House is not a good map, and I think if that map passes, a lot of Republicans are going to be disappointed in this state. I'll try it this way. Does Kayla need to wear her normal professional business shoes or her filibuster sneakers to the Capitol Monday? Uh, you, you might want to pick the more comfortable shoe for Monday. <laughs> Let's talk about one of the things that, look, I think this, that maybe the whole session is being defined right now mm -hmm. about the relationship with, we'll call it your caucus, which is a caucus inside the larger Republican caucus, and how the leadership is pulled between the supporters of them that are probably ready to move on to some of their priorities mm -hmm. and your supporters. Uh, I wondered this for a while. If this all kind of came together three years ago, a conservative caucus, you've grown it. If you were in your, if you were in the leadership situation, how would you deal with a leader of the conservative caucus? 
Well, first of all, if I were a, if I were in leadership in the Missouri Senate, there wouldn't mm -hmm. be a conservative caucus uh, because I wouldn't be focusing on uh, just the needs of the one third of the caucus or the needs of just the two thirds of the caucus. I'd be focused on the needs of the entire caucus, and that means uh, making sure that every senator's priority in that caucus is actually a priority. When you've and, got and doesn't thirty-four, get you get twenty-four senators mm -hmm. though. It's a super majority. Do you think those priorities cross sometimes? Uh, they do, but I think that before we had our current leadership team, that was something that was handled relatively well. I mean, you know that I had some, uh, I had some. Uh, difficult days with Ron Richard when he was the pro tem, but uh, I thought, you know, ultimately, compared to what we have right now, he, he did a pretty good job making sure that the caucus was protected. And I think if you look at the things that we need to be protected from is taking bad votes uh, as a caucus on things that put us at odds uh, with the uh, primary base of voters that put us in office in the first place. So if you're talking about the largest tax increase in the history of the state, that's terrible for our brand. If you're talking about uh, not passing a vote that would have defunded uh, Planned Parenthood and abortion providers in our state, that's putting it at odd with the people who have supported us for going on 20 years right now. So if you do that, then that also puts the leadership in a position to where uh, they can be defenders of individual centers, whether it's of their agenda or maybe it's just coming down to protecting them from the possibility of people that want to try to go after them in their re-election cycle. Uh, that's not happening right now. If I were in leadership, I can tell you that would change. So for me, uh, it's it's, I, I don't know where we go from here because part of that has to be dictated by our majority floor leader who has presided over a scenario where for the past month and a half of, of, uh, op, of activity in the Missouri Senate, we've seen nothing but strife. Is the, that the relationship between yourself and Senator Rout and maybe the most important relationship in the legislature, it doesn't feel like it's in a good place. Is that possible to turn that around? We'll see. I think that we've had, uh, I've always been open to meeting and talking. Uh, we did have some conversations, uh, Senator Rowden and I, uh, during the off season. But, uh, you know, take this redistricting uh, is a really good example. There was no reason for the redistricting process to become the fight that it has because uh, I think a lot of folks, myself included, were willing to have this conversation and see what could be worked mm -hmm. out uh, long before we got back into session. But that didn't happen. And now there's a fight on the floor that's hurting the caucus, hurting the brand. Uh, and you know, you can't help but wonder in hindsight, you know, could we have done this better? I think we could have. Speaking of the party, they're all coming to St. Charles next weekend. Mm -hmm. Lincoln Days, I don't remember it ever being it. I'm sure it has been in St. Charles before. Uh, first time I remember, I think that, is that a, um, is that a nod from the MRP that where St. Charles is? Well, I'll tell you what, it's the, I, I've always described St. Charles as it's the biggest Republican stronghold of the state. It gave uh, Donald Trump a net of 50,000 votes in 2020. Uh, the, next, the next county after that was 20,000 net votes. I was down in Greene County in Springfield. So uh, it doesn't surprise me. I think you're going to see St. Charles continue to play a, a big role in Missouri politics with all the Republicans that are there and moving there. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they're going to play uh, a large, outsized role in the policy of the state for the next couple decades. Senator, I'll wear my comfortable boots Monday, and we'll look forward to seeing how it turns out. Scott, thanks for having me. Thank you, guys. We'll be back with our opinion maker. But first, I want to make an announcement. Our stage of the year, the thing we have every year, is going to be this year, February 22nd in Jeff City. It's going to be Senator Roy Blunt. Please come join us. Make all the plans you can to come to Jeff City. 6 o'clock over at Turkey Creek, across the river, Event Center. We're going to honor Senator Blunt his career serving Missourians. We'll be right back after this. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right to work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Your energy needs are changing. That's why at Ameren, Missouri, we're not waiting on the future. We're building it with the Smart Energy Plan, advancing thousands of projects across the state, helping reduce emissions through cleaner energy sources, boost reliability with self-healing equipment, and better withstand storms with new composite poles. 
moving Missouri forward and bringing us all a little closer together. That's energy at work. Welcome back. This week at Missouri Politics Opinion Maker Panel Time, Patrick Lynn, Democratic Strategist. Welcome back to the show, sir. Glad to be here. Sam Gladney, attorney, thoughtful guy, father now, a disappointed Chiefs fan. Very sorry about your loss. Absolutely. I'm getting over it. Greg Geller, the sharpest tongue in the Republican Party. Lincoln Days this weekend. You going to be able to come? I don't think I'm going to be able to make it, actually. You'll be there in spirit. <laughs> I'll be there in spirit. And Jeff Rorda, so folks watching this show are going to like not know why this is a big deal, but you'll notice you are now on camera right. Officially switch parties, right? If I was any further, I'd be out of frame. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most folks that watch this show are going to be like, he wasn't a Republican the whole time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I always wonder why he was on that side of the set. Yeah, it made no sense. <laughs> Patrick Lynn, uh, this week the big story was the state health director, Governor Parsons' nominee, was rejected by the Senate. The Republicans tried to fire you so many times they could <laughs> never <laughs> ever get it done. Uh, you were you were five and zero oh against them or whatever. Yeah. But the the health director was gone. It was an interesting. I think they all kind of had their own reasons. Uh, what did you make of it as a guy that actually understands what this person does for a living? Yeah. Well, fortunately for me, I never took an appointed office, so That's you, you, you know, they can never fire <laughs> you. But in the executive branch, but um, uh, I, it's a, it's a obviously it's a critical position. It's a critical position today with what we have going on. Um, uh, it, this has happened. I, I've done these fights before with uh, health department directors, whether or not they were pro-life or pro-choice, to get <laughs> them through the Senate. I think this is unfortunate. I think this is a very qualified man for the job. And um, it's unfortunate what they put him through over politics. Greg Keller, lay out the case for why this person is not going to work Monday as the dire state director of health. Well, there's a whole lot of distrust amongst the electorate at large and certainly within the Republican Party about the way um, that our opponents on the other side of the aisle have gone about this entire COVID situation. I think that there are some concerns that the, that the director or acting director gave some answers behind closed doors to certain senators that when he got into committee, those answers seemed to change. So I think it was a big credibility thing. There's a big credibility problem with the Democrat Party at large here too, though, and I think they're going to feel the brunt of it come November because what they have done over the last year and a half is shut down all of our businesses and stop educating our children because their largest campaign donor, the education unions, told them to. But wait, this is a Republican governor who appointed this guy. The Democrats have nothing to do I, with this health department. Didn't even director. kill him. Yeah. I think the Democrats have everything to do with the amount of distrust that there is on the COVID issue generally, because you guys decided that money was more important than educating children. Now, Jeff Rota, you're into 67. Well, I'll, I'll tell you about my into 67. I'm not sure. I don't, the, these folks had reasons, but obviously I think it did come from closed door meetings. Uh, but overall, I felt like talking to the protesters that did come. I mean, y'all St. Louisans come over a lot and, and you share your opinions and you're, you're quite loud about them in the rotunda there. They came over. And I think it had as much to do with the fact that it's been two years, right or wrong, it's been two years. These public health experts, they call themselves an expert, they haven't really got rid of COVID, and they tell you all these hoops to jump through, and I think folks are just done with it. And I, and I picked up the frustration with someone that calls with a public health expert today, regular folks on mine to 67, they're just kind of done with it and want you all to move on. And, and you know what, folks are going to get sick and die, and if that Ramp, amped up, it would change, but I, I thought it was just kind of a frustration with the whole thing. How is it on your end of six seven? Well, I mean, people are frustrated, and you know, I've heard this past week and really this entire uh, session that the Senate is in disarray and in dysfunction. This is actually how the Senate's supposed to work. When there, you know, when there's earnest dissent, you know, there's a real controversy here about the health department and how we approach COVID and other issues and it worked out the way it worked out. Who came up with the concept the Senate was supposed to pass bills? You, you know who wins? There's six million Missourians win when they kill bills. I mean, really, is there an idea so brilliant and wonderful it has to pass this year? Yeah, that it's, the, it's, you know, dissent by design. Sam Gladney, there was a lot of pushback. The governor uh, did not take losing his nominee lightly. He uh, fired back. He said, this is a person I vetted and hired, and he shared my Christian values, and the Senate I guess did not believe that. Part of that is being pro-life in 2002 Missouri was a very different thing than 2022 Missouri. But uh, also, I think he was um, he was quite frustrated. This was a guy he thought could do the job and couldn't make it through. Well, it's a sad day for the state. I think when, when somebody um, of this caliber isn't able to get the job because it, it seems like he supported uh, vaccines, not even vaccine mandates, but just vaccines. And I think what this means, bigger, longer term for the state and for just for government service in general, this is this might make it harder for competent, um, normal people to want to serve in these roles. You know, if you if you put your name up for it and you get trashed and, and what have you, 
What, what makes those sorts of folks is decide that, this type Is that of a concern? I mean, Randall Williams did not have a parade when he left. Now you, you brought in a guy that I think most in the public health community would figure, <clears throat> confident guy, he doesn't get confirmed. Has the job been devalued from, say, three years ago? I think it has. Patty, let me ask you this question. You're one of the more articulate folks I know uh, on, the, on the Democrat side, on the liberal <laughs> side, I'd even say. No, seriously, if you're a person who truly is just done with this. You live in a part of the state, a part of the state I watched you actually travel for Joe Biden and go talk to folks. And it's not, you're not going to the Capitol protest. I mean, you're, you're working for a living, but you just, you're done. You're, you've just come to the realization this is just gonna be part of our lives and you want the government to leave you alone. That's all you want. You don't want another booster. You don't, you just want left alone. How do you explain to that person why it's still important to have some of these health restrictions in place? Well, I, I, I think we've tried. Um, it hasn't worked, um, with, it, with which I think it's mainly more because of the disinformation on the other side saying that the, the vaccines don't work, they're unsafe, and people question it when they're not. Look, and, you know, we can talk about teachers' unions or whatever, but the, the facts are if a school district has masks, it keeps kids in the classroom. We see it, we see it every week. A, a school district goes from masks to no masks, and the COVID cases rise, and they go back to masks. Keep the masks on the kids, they stay in the classroom and keep learning. Greg Hill, at the end of the day, I think this came down to, yes, this person had some relationships that soured with some members of the Senate, but I think also folks are just done. Yeah, folks are done, and masks don't work. We've seen that in state after state. Well, if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask, right? Yeah, but don't make kids do it. I, I would remind the table that, that children under the age of 15 are more likely to die via lightning strike than they are from COVID. I have no idea why we're making them wear masks, and particularly given what that does to their social development, um, it, it's totally insane. I think that's one of the things that people are most mad about now is they know that COVID poses literally zero, virtually zero risk to their children, yet their children have been out of school for a year and a half and have to walk around with sodden diapers on their face. Let's, talk about, let's talk about a, uh, something that does pose a risk to Congressman Cleaver. Yeah. They're going to go back, I guess, tomorrow, <laughs> come back in early and try to, try to draw a map. There's some folks on the right that want a 7-1 map, currently it's 6 to 2. They want, there's a map folded by the House. It's 6-2. Some folks would argue the, uh, how strong the second is. But what's the case for a 7-1 map to get rid of Congressman Cleaver? Well, I believe it's the old H.L. Mencken quote that democracy is the idea that, that the people know what they want and they deserve to get it good and hard. I think the same <laughs> principle applies here to redistricting. I love redistricting. I think it should be as partisan as possible. That's what the system calls for. Look at what the Democrats have done to the Republicans in New York State. 23-2. That's the map that they have drawn in New York State. I find it that cute, the Democrats, yeah, when Democrats would be like, well, we have 40% of the vote, we get this, well, that matters nowhere else, right? And you know what? Fine with me. That's the rule of the game. Yeah. Look at what they're doing to us just over across the river in Illinois. It, virtually the exact same thing. And now we're supposed to lay over and we're <laughs> supposed to be the nice guys? Give me a break. These guys deserve to get it good and hard, just like we're getting it in other states. Sam glad to, as a Democrat, is there any way to defend what Illinois does? It is just blatantly wrong. I mean, right? I, I personally don't get too upset about uh, the gerrymandering stuff. I think yeah. it's, it's what happens. If you have power in a state, you generally use it. I think the problem with the 7-1 map that the Republicans are talking about is in a bad Republican year, that could become a 5-3 map pretty easily. So yeah. I think that's bad even for them. I think I would like for there to be a 5-3 map. I think 6-2 is probably where it ends up and probably where it should. Greg, you've been around these rooms. If you were on the other side, I mean, I understand the uh, the value of six safe districts and all that stuff. Uh, this is just a partisan bare knuckle game, right? I, I unfortunately I have to agree with Greg on this one, <laughs> but uh, I will say though, you know, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered, so be careful what you wish for. Jeff Rorta, I mean, to me, is this a poker game? It's like right now, you you've got X number of Republicans, you can split them up six ways or seven ways. You get aggressive and push your chips in, or or you play a little safer and, and make sure that you that you have six. Well, I think you give it too much credit. I mean, I don't want to uh, take any cheap shots at the abysmal job my Senate opponent did running this map through the House, but uh, they ought to call this map the Police Defenders Protection Act because it makes life easy for Cory Bush. And it makes it easier well, for the Jeff squad. You're from Jeff the home of Escobo. He saved Cor Kim Gardner, and now he's going to save uh, Manuel Cleaver. Well, I don't know that he saves Manuel Cleaver. I think that the next Corey Bush from Kansas City comes in and 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 knocks him out just like they did Lacey, and then we have another police defender. If in there was a Corey Bush type politician in that district, this would not be much of a discussion. They would just move right. 
Right, of course, of course. And we're, we're, uh, Emmanuel's become a, a straw man for, for a, what a good Democratic congressman looks like, but that's not what we're going to end up with when, with what we've seen from the squad in Missouri. And, you know, you've got a mayor over there that's cut $47 million out of their police budget. The, the situation's ripe for a takeover. So, Keller, whether it's Emmanuel Cleaver, Cory Bush, you don't care, you want him gone, right? Uh, no, I, I actually quite like having Cory Bush there. I think that's, <laughs> in a seven, as a Republican, I think that's, other than having seven, I think that's the single most important she, thing. She'd be the last one off the island, right, of Democrat she, she, she is the spokesperson for the Missouri Democrat Party, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Patrick Glenn, there's a U.S. Senate race. I'm um, going to tell a lot about who the spokesman for the Missouri Republican Party is. Uh, right now, handicap it for me. I think it's Eric Greiden's race to lose on the Republican primary. I don't think that many people are locked in hard. I mean, this is not a Democrat-Republican thing. This is which Republican? Yeah, I think it's interesting. When this first started, I thought that Eric Greitens' floor number, the lowest he could probably go, was somewhere in the mid-30s. Turns out he's already in the mid-20s right now. So I think he's actually, you could make the case, I believe, that he's in actually worse shape than, than he should be at this point. And it was just announced this week, his campaign is, is literally not just broke. They have less than zero money in his campaign account. So he's going to have to find some way to fill those coffers or he's not going to make it much longer. Jeff Roy, running a police union, you know the attorney general. I, uh, I wasn't quite sure how he was going to connect to folks uh, in rural Missouri. And then this issue with masks came up. Mm -hmm. And he's been just so, you don't have to wonder where he's at on that issue. Right. I think that's been something that's turned him as to how does he win this race to, okay, this is how he's going to win this race. Uh, he's looked very senatorial so far. Uh, he's He's run the election smart. He's running the attorney general's office uh, in a way that, that reminds people that he's tapped into federal issues. And uh, he, uh, most importantly, he has the endorsement of the fraternal order of police, the early endorsement. Uh, to me, I can see a scenario where both Eric's attack each other and Vicki Hartzler, who truly is what she says she is, a very devout Christian woman, comes up the middle and wins. Sure, absolutely. And I don't, I think Schmidt, <clears throat> can you keep this going? I, there's uh, schools that fought this so hard. I think every day they fight is probably a good day for Eric Schmidt. I mean, I, I personally think all the mask lawsuits seem a little cartoonish, but I'm not a Republican primary voter, so you might, you might be right there. Well, well Jeff Rody, you are a Republican primary voter now. Who won the week? Uh, I would say Barnes Hospital did. We had four police officers critically injured uh, this past week, uh, one who shouldn't have lived. There's only a half a dozen hospitals in the country that could have saved Colin Ledbetter's life, and Barnes Hospital did it. Terrific. Who won the week, Rick? Senator Bill Eigel. Uh, it, I, I think uh, the, the, the powers that be in the Senate now realize that they need to treat with the uh, Senate Conservative Caucus if they mean to get anything done. Helps be in the room when you say that, right? Who won the week? It does. IBW Local won. Their member was out there sledding <laughs> yesterday on the, on the top of that uh, garbage can uh, with a bush in, in hand, even being nice to scabs. Just everything was fantastic. Um, IBW Local won. Who won the week? Uh, those school districts in Missouri that are standing up to our Attorney General and his frivolous lawsuits. I'm going to say, uh, Senator from right here in St. Louis, Steve Roberts, won the week. He uh, chose to uh, sponsor the confirmation of his former uh, predecessor, Senator Jimmy Linda Sheed. He, uh, he could have went a different way on that. He chose to be a statesman and helped her get confirmed with the probation and parole board. We hope you'll join us next week from the state capitol for this week in Missouri politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, sponsored by the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, Spire, and Sterling Bank.